You are listening to the Love Unplugged podcast, episode 74. Today we are taking a deep dive into menstrual cycles. So what actually happens during our periods? How do we determine what's normal and what isn't with our hormones? And ultimately, how can we align our businesses with our cycle in the best way for success throughout the month? Personally, I learned a ton and I'm so excited to share this knowledge with you all as well. So without further ado, let's jump on in. Hey there, I'm your host, Jessica Fergon, and I am passionate about doing the inner work needed to reach your goals. Let me be your guide as we navigate all the fears and insecurities that surface when it's time to step outside of your comfort zone. Along with my knowledgeable guests and industry experts, I'm here to teach you how to reawaken your life purpose and passion and create the steps to turn your intentions into action. Ultimately, my goal is to empower you to rise above those blocks holding you back and start living a life that you are worthy and deserving of. So come on, it's time to slow down, find a comfy spot with your favorite organic tea and get inspired. Thank you for tuning in to the Love Unplugged podcast. Hello loves, today I am joined by Nicole Jardim, a certified women's health coach and functional nutritional coach with a specialty in hormonal and reproductive health. She is also well known as the period girl and she is the creator of Fix Your Period, a series of programs that empower women to reclaim their hormone health using a method that combines simplicity and sass, which I just love. Now I'm going to be very clear here, I've started reading her new book and It was mind-blowing to me how little I know about my own period. Um, I mean, my mom never really talked to me about my period. It just kind of magically showed up when I was in elementary school. I think it was grade six or grade seven. And I just kind of figured things out as I went. But I literally know nothing. So this is a huge educational moment for me uh, sitting down with Nicole. And I hope that you guys learn as much as I do in this interview. So welcome, Nicole. I am just so honored to have you as my guest. And I'm so excited to learn all about your story and advice and about my own period. Thank you so much, Jessica, for having me. I, I feel your excitement and I can't wait to dive into all of this good information. Awesome. All right. So I want to kind of start at the very beginning. What was your own period experience like and what inspired you to kind of dive deep into this subject and become an expert in it? Well, I definitely didn't think I was going to be known as the period girl ever in my whole life because I had no idea about how my body worked at all. And at the same time, I was also the poster child for period problems. I had so many issues. My period was super, super heavy. It completely disrupted my life. It was so painful. I basically lived on pain medication for the first few days of my period every single month. And, you know, I would constantly be having weight gain and weight loss. My moods were a disaster. I just felt like a total mess in my teenage years. And it then progressively got worse because like you, my mom didn't really know anything about periods. She knew that hers were really bad when she was a teenager. So she assumed it was normal. And they eventually started coming every three or four months. And I remember thinking, okay, this might be a blessing in disguise. (laughs) And in the end, I decided to finally go see her gynecologist, my mom's gynecologist, and she immediately put me on the pill. And I just thought, okay, this is great. Now I don't have to worry about all of my period issues because she promised me that all of it would go away magically. And magically it did. Unfortunately, I we can talk about this, of course, but the pill did not work for my body. It did not agree with me at all. And over a few years of taking it, I started having all of these other symptoms. So I went from being the poster child for period problems to being the poster child for pill problems. And I had hair loss. I was developing melasma all over my face, which typically one would only get when they're pregnant. That's what the dermatologist told me. And I ended up starting to have these UTIs and yeast infections, and then they became chronic infections. And I remember sex started to hurt. And I mean, I could go on and on. I had horrible gut health issues. I was just, and I felt constantly sick. It was not a pretty picture. And it was only until I, you know, it took about four or five years to finally figure out that conventional medicine really didn't have anything to offer me. And I found an acupuncturist who was referred by a friend 
And he was the first person ever in all those years to say that he thought perhaps the pill might have something to do with the issues that I was having. And at first I didn't believe him. And then finally it all started to click. And eventually I went off of the pill and I continued working with him and changing my diet and starting, I started to figure out more lifestyle changes. And this was almost 20 years ago. So there really, none of this stuff was even existed. I just sort of was feeling around in the dark, trying to figure things out as I went. And that's really what led me down this path of doing this work. It was one of those things that was completely serendipitous because I was on track to be in film production. That's what I'd studied in school. That was the goal in life. And there was no women's health, nothing (laughs) that I was planning to do in my life. But here we are, you know, life just has a way of pushing you down a path that you need to go. Wow. That's a crazy journey. (laughs) It is. (laughs) I, I remember when I started taking the pill, I was I was not happy with the results. I wasn't happy with the the symptoms that I was experiencing with it either. So I stopped it immediately and I noticed that things kind of went back a little bit to normal. Um, but I mean, we're gonna get into the pill and your thoughts on that and all that stuff down in the in, towards the end of the interview, but you know, the pill is just there's so many options out there and there's so many ways that it can impact your health on so many levels. Like it's insane what that pill can do. Isn't it though? It is. It's unbelievable. And I think that unfortunately there is such a lack of informed consent when it comes to taking the pill or any other form of hormonal birth control, because they're generally viewed as safe and benign medications, but Mm -hmm. there are absolutely side effects. And some of them are as serious as death. And I think that we are, are, we tend to be grossly misinformed about how the pill or other forms of hormonal contraceptives can impact our health. And then some of them are as mild as just like having a yeast infection every now and again. And so Mm -hmm. it really, I think so much is dependent on our unique bodies, what's going on with our health generally and how we, that's, you know, that will determine how we respond to, to the pill or any other form of hormone. Yeah. And what kind of saddens me a little bit is I've seen it so many times with really young girls who are like 15, 16 years old. And, you know, maybe they have breakouts and things like that because of their hormones and whatnot. And the doctor is just pushing the pill on them. Pretty much. Like, is that really the right way to go about this? Like, Mm. I I just, I don't get it personally, but teach their own. (laughs) I know. It's really challenging because, of course, the narrative is that teenagers don't know anything, they're irresponsible, they're not fully, you know, their brains aren't fully developed. All of there are a lot of arguments for why we would just, you know, slap a birth control pill on a teenager or another form of long acting reversible contraception like an IUD or an implant. And I feel like that is really it's shortchanging girls and menstruators in the sense that they are you know, they're not being taught such vital information. And like we were just saying, you're, you know, you're in your thirties and this is stuff that I feel like we should have been taught when we were 12, 13, 14. hundred percent. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's get into our periods. Now, from reading your book, I understand now that there are actually four phases to menstruation, which I only thought that there was like the period part and that was basically (laughs) it. And yeah, (laughs) it was just really, really sad. Um, So I kind of want to understand all four phases and what they actually are. Oh, totally. I And I so appreciate this question because I love talking about this information, especially because of the fact that Again, we are we're taught that your period is kind of the star of the show or probably not the star of the show for many of us because they suck. But um, yes, like I consider something like ovulation to actually be the star of the show rather than your period because ovulation is what drives so many of these phases and what's happening. And so when we're talking about these phases of your cycle, everyone should just envision menstruation or your period as that first phase. It begins on day one. Day one of your period is day one of your entire menstrual cycle. And that usually, what I like to see is a period that lasts somewhere between three and seven days. For some of us, a little bit shorter. For some, it's longer. But that's kind of the ideal that we're going for. And in that phase, we also have 
um, the what is next is the follicular phase or the I call it the non bleeding portion of the follicular phase, because really that first half of your cycle is the whole follicular. We just divide it up into menstruation and then this non bleeding follicular phase, or at least that's how I describe it. And what's happening actually from even before you get your period, uh, your body is getting a follicle ready in your ovary to get ready for ovulation. So it's like prepping and prepping. And then as you get your period, and then um, when you're moving out of your period phase and leading into your follicular and then ovulatory phase, what's happening is um, your there's a follicle on your ovary and it is being chosen. So it's becoming the dominant follicle out of the other ones that are also being prepped and ready. And so one of these follicles is chosen as the dominant one and it's the one that's on track for ovulation. And as your what's happening on a hormonal level is amazing because your brain is basically sending follicle stimulating hormone, the name basically says what it does. And that is, is stimulating the follicles in your ovary. Those follicles in turn are producing are producing estrogen. And estrogen is now rising as you move towards ovulation. And this is a time in cycles when menstruators really feel amazing. They feel so good <laughs> because estrogen's rising, testosterone is rising, things are moving in, in a good direction. And your sex drive tends to, to rise as well during this time. And it'll mostly peak at ovulation time. And then what happens is as you get towards ovulation, you're also noticing your cervical fluid changes as well because estrogen is stimulating your cervix to produce this uh, fertile quality fluid. And so that's actually going to help sperm um, swim up your your vaginal canal. And because it has it has channels in it. It's amazing. So our bodies are always trying to get us pregnant, just so everyone knows. It's just kind of what happens every single cycle. <laughs> it's not, it's nothing personal. It's just what bodies do. <laughs> kind of like the furthering of the species thing. And so this is what ovulation is all about. The thing is, is that healthy ovulation is basically interchangeable with fertility. So we have one and we have the other. And if one is not working, the other is not going to be working well either. So it's really important for us to consider that ovulation is a sign of health. And so when we're getting to ovulation, our cervical fluid is now at that wettest consistency. It's going to be, you might notice it being stretchy between your fingers. You might notice it's watery. And then as you get closer to ovulation, your energy is going to be usually is going to be highest. Your skin looks really great. Your hair looks amazing. Again, the idea of is hair is for procreation. So you're going to look your best. You're likely going to feel your best. And when we get to ovulation, so that egg is now released from the follicle on your ovary and it sits in your fallopian tube and lives for about 12 to 24 hours. And then it will just disintegrate. But if there is a sperm cell that happens to show up and it, you know, combines with the egg and fertilizes it, that egg will slowly but surely travel down the fallopian tube and make its way to the to the uterus where it would implant. And so that's what happens in the second half of your cycle. So after ovulation ends. So progesterone starts to take over now. Estrogen drops, testosterone drops progesterone takes over, we move into what's known as the luteal phase. And this is the second half where progesterone is higher. And progesterone is interesting because it's a thermogenic hormone. So it's a heat inducing hormone, meaning that it raises your basal body temperature. And that's amazing too, because that's the way uh, women who practice the fertility awareness method of birth control, that is how they know that they've ovulated and they're no longer fertile for the rest of their cycle. So progesterone goes up, your basal body temperature goes up, you take that in the morning usually. And it, progesterone is the, like we call it, or I call it, I jokingly call it the keep calm and carry on hormone because it's kind of like an anti-anxiety hormone. It, it calms your nervous system. Unfortunately for a lot of us, we just don't have enough of it and we can get into why that is. But yes, yeah, so basically progesterone dominates the luteal phase. And at this time, your cervical fluid dries up. So it starts to get this sticky, tacky type of texture or becomes creamy again. So you notice a drastic shift in your cervical fluid from pre-ovulatory fertile to infertile. And this is pretty much what's going on for the rest of your cycle and until you get your period. So then you start over the cycle again as you approach menstruation. You're, you might spot for a day or two. You might spot for longer. If you're spotting for longer than a day or two, that's often a sign that progesterone is prematurely dropping or your progesterone is just not high enough because your progesterone actually holds your uterine lining in place. 
So we end up um, going back into the next cycle and, and doing this whole process all over again when you get your period again. Holy crap. <laughs> That's that's a lot going on in that, in that period. That's... Right? It's insane. And I told you probably a quarter of what actually happens. <laughs> our hormonal interplay is unmatched. I mean, men do not have anything like this. It's amazing. We do a lot on a monthly basis, ladies. <laughs> we mm-hmm. sure do. <laughs> Holy smokes. That's crazy. Okay, so my very first question is, which I feel so stupid asking some of these questions, but no, whatever. Not at all. So the follicle isn't the egg. So how, where does the egg come from that attaches to the follicle? Great question. So the egg actually is housed in the follicle. So the follicles, we, and everyone should know, because I get this question a lot, like what happened, you know, how do we run out of eggs, blah, 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 you know, that whole thing, uh, because that's all terrifying for many of us. You know, we spend the first 25, 30 years of our lives trying not to get pregnant. And then we spend a significant amount of time trying to get pregnant after not trying for a long time. And it can be really stressful and challenging. And one of the big questions is, well, like what happens to our eggs? And, you know, we're, we're born with a certain number of follicles and those follicles contain our eggs. And so then the follicles either pretty much are on the ovary, in the ovary, on the ovary. And they are, you know, and the mechanisms are slightly complicated. And I don't know that they really know exactly how it all works. But ultimately, what's happening is a certain set of follicles are chosen, you know, every cycle, and they are stimulated, like I was saying, and then one becomes dominant around uh, a few days after your period ends, it, it, it moves into that dominant phase, and it's chosen for ovulation. And so the egg actually bursts out of your follicle at ovulation. And then what happens to the rest is they sort of just shrink back down again. And then more follicles are chosen in the next in the next cycle and the next. But we're born with, you know, many hundreds of thousands of follicles. So this is not something a, a situation of us running out of them so much as it is what we're doing with our lifestyle and our diet and our nutrients, because that is what is going to impact our follicles and our ovaries more than anything else. Gotcha. Okay, so at 36, having not procreated yet. Yes. Like I now I'm wondering about how many follicles are left and are the good ones the ones that get taken first? Um that's a great question. I really don't think that that's how it works and I will say to you that this is like I said before this is not a situation of having enough follicles or enough eggs. It's about what is happening with your diet, with your stress, with your gut health, with your liver, how your liver detoxes uh, toxins and hormones and all of that. So every system in your body is playing a role because your ovaries are pretty sensitive to, to inflammation. And when we're inflamed, that impacts our ovarian tissue significantly. And so for some of us, it you know can become really problematic. Some women go into what's known as premature ovarian failure or primary ovarian insufficiency. So these are you know inter- used interchangeably, but essentially it's what happens when your ovaries stop working the way they're supposed to before you actually hit perimenopause or or premenopause. So before the age of forty, typically, and. And what I'm seeing a lot of is I'm seeing a lot of that. And and when I say a lot, it's, you know, it's a very small percentage of the population. So I'm not trying to freak people out, but it's really important for us to think about ovarian aging and how that happens and why. But one of the best guarantees I feel for women is to actually take care of yourself because we tend to do a lot of things to our faces, right? Am I right? <laughs> we do yes. a lot of laser treatments, a lot of chemical peels, all the things, but we don't think about ovarian anti-aging. And the way to support your ovaries, in my opinion, is to be super focused on your health and your well-being, if that's possible for you. Because if you can do that, then that to me is an important, very important foundational step to ensuring that you stay fertile longer. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. I like that. Yes. (laughs) Don't worry. You're 36. (laughs) Honestly, like, I think that's the other thing too. I kind of, I try to sort of debunk this, this belief that we are, 
we basically form fall off of a, a hormonal or a fertility cliff at 40 or 35 even, because that is really the narrative that exists in our culture that at 35, if you haven't had babies, you better get on that. And, you know, or doctors will look at certain test results and say, oh, yeah, you really need to get started now kind of thing, as if we have no control, as if we're just mm -hmm. sitting ducks. And this is just, you know, our lot in life. And I fundamentally disagree with that. I actually do not believe that. I really believe that we have so much more control over the outcome of our ovarian function and our fertility than we've been led to believe. Yes, definitely. Now, you brought up a funny point that, you know, people are like, oh, you hit 35 is like, oh, you got to get working on it. And it reminds me of a very funny story where I was having a pap test just like a couple years ago, or I think it was. And it was with a new doctor. So obviously, it's kind of awkward and a little nervous because it's a new doctor. I don't know this person. And they're in a very private area and literally like spread eagle. And she's like, oh, how old are you? And I'm like, I said my age at that time, I think I was like 34 or whatever. And she's like, and you don't have children yet? Oh, my God. And Lord. I'm like, no. She's like, you better start working on that now. And I'm like, this is really the time to be bringing this up? Like, honestly? Yeah. Like, are you seeing something down there that I don't? <laughs> But this is what I'm saying. Like, how does that make you feel? Doesn't does that immediately bring up feelings of fear and lack? And I'm not. I I got to get on this right now, or I might miss out on this huge life changing event that I want to have happen in my life. Hundred percent. And I'm like, I don't even know a hundred percent if I want kids yet. But now I feel like this ticking time bomb inside me that's telling me you better hurry up because your time is running out. And I'm like. I did not need that at that moment. Thank you very much. <laughs> I cannot agree with you more. And I've heard a version of this story many times over. And I really, it really bugs me because they've now planted a seed and mm -hmm. that seed is going to grow because there are many other people who are watering that seed by telling you that, yes, fertility is on a major decline after 35, which actually isn't true if you look at the research. And again, I feel like they're basing that assessment on outdated information and the fact that I have seen so many women over the years and many of my colleagues have as well go on to have not one, not two, even three sometimes babies in their 40s after they were told that they couldn't. And so while I'm not saying it's necessarily easy and it, it does involve work and there are significant changes that sometimes have to be made, it is 100% possible to be fertile in your late 30s and even in your early 40s. And I don't think that, you know, and again, like I should say this, that that's not the case for everyone. But I do think that we need to have a bit of a shift around how, what we believe is possible for our health and our fertility at these ages. I love that. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you for that. No problem. All right. So I want to dive into hormones because obviously hormones definitely get out of whack sometimes during our period. And I kind of want to understand what is normal and what we should expect versus what is a sign that there's something imbalanced? Yeah, I really love this question because again, I think that this is the question I get the most. So something along the lines of, I'm experiencing XYZ. Is this normal? And mm -hmm. it, it comes back to, of course, education about how our bodies work and the fact that it's, you know, nobody got the periods 101 memo <laughs> when we were in middle school and high school. So I would say that with your hormones, what's most important to understand is that the top tier hormones, I, I call it the hormonal hierarchy because I think that that's really what this is, are cortisol and insulin. And it's not that those are what your body has designated as top tier hormones is what I designated as them because they have such a downstream effect on your other hormones. And so here's the deal with cortisol and insulin. Cortisol is the stress hormone. Insulin is the blood sugar hormone. And cortisol is released by your adrenals. Insulin is released by your pancreas when you eat, things like that. The problem here is that our modern culture, our modern society has decided that cortisol problems and insulin problems are no big deal. Because if you can't sleep, we have solutions for that. And if you are, you know, and if you have all kinds of other energy issues, we've, we've got all of that covered too. So you can sleep when you die. That type of mentality is what pervades our society with, you know, and then with insulin, similar. 
you have blood sugar problems, don't worry about that. You can just, you can take a medication. If you have diabetes, we can give you insulin. So we are never really dealing with the root causes of the cortisol and the insulin problems. And what we run into is a situation where for females in particular, we have a menstrual cycle that then starts to reflect these problems, these bigger systemic problems. And that's where we start to think, oh, we have a hormonal imbalance. But the hormonal imbalance started probably a long time ago with the cortisol and with the insulin, because we're all so perpetually stressed and we're not dealing with with our stressors. We're not helping to mitigate the effects of the stress in our bodies at all. And with the blood sugar and insulin, same thing. We're just eating in a way that is not conducive to our body's metabolism, to how we're meant to eat. And so as a result, we have all of these cortisol and insulin issues for many years. They're totally normalized in our society. So we think, oh, well, we're tired and groggy or we're not sleeping. No big deal. It's just kind of part of it and or part of the experience of being a human in the modern world. And so then what happens is cortisol wreaks havoc on your menstrual cycle and so does insulin over time. I can explain how that works, but they definitely have an effect on ovulation and your ovarian function. And as a result, that throws off the entire system. And then we start to develop all kinds of menstrual problems. And then women are like, wait a second, I must have a hormonal imbalance. I have estrogen dominance or my progesterone isn't high enough or my testosterone is too high. All of those can be traced back to cortisol and stress hormone imbalances and blood sugar and insulin imbalances. So that's ultimately where it starts. So everyone knows, but the signs that most women see of a hormonal imbalance are things like PMS that's getting worse, heavy periods that are getting heavier, or lighter periods that are getting progressively lighter and lighter, or they're skipping a period completely. Other signs of it as well are um, acne, so hormonal acne, especially acne that shows up at different times in the cycle, and things like ovulatory pain or period pain or migraines. So these are, are signs that something is off with your hormones. And like I said, it's usually related to the upstream problems. Hmm. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. I know. All right. So can we fix that with food and vitamins and supplements? Like how do we fix those root issues? Great question. So what I have found is that with when it comes to food and lifestyle changes, that's what I consider to be the foundation. I think it's, you know, it's why I wrote the book the way I wrote the book, because I I've read many hormone books over the years and I've loved all of them. But what I found is that we weren't getting a very clear directive on how to address this foundational problem. And that is we need to, we need to eat certain foods. We need to potentially take some supplements. We also need to address what's going on with our gut, with our liver, with our thyroid and with our stress. And as a result, I have found that just women will come to me and they'll say, well, I've tried like 20,000 things and nothing seems to work. And I'm like, well, we probably just need to go back to the basics. And what I found is that for the most part, none of us are really addressing the basics. We're just, we're sort of throwing things at the problem. And so we really have to come back to what, what works for us. Because I find also too, and I'm sure you're aware of this. We tend to look outside of ourselves. We tend to look at the latest diet or doctor or guru to help fix us, to fix the issues that we have going on, rather than checking in with ourselves. I can't tell you how many women I've heard from over the years who said, well, I've lost my period. It happened six months ago. I have no idea why. I'm like, okay, well, what did what happened six months ago? Did you change your diet? Did you take a certain supplement? Did you start exercising more? What happened? Oh, yeah, I started the keto diet. And this isn't to blame the keto diet by any means, because it certainly is appropriate in, in some instances, no doubt. But the point here is that we are so focused on other people's solutions that we don't we fail to recognize what might be right for us. And as a result, we end up falling into situations like that where we lose our period or our period becomes really wonky and we don't know why. And so we really, I really want women to come back home to themselves, to start to really pay attention to how something impacts them rather than how it's supposed to impact their bodies or what they've been told it's supposed to do. And so with that said, 
the way I've focused my work over the years and basically what I wrote in Fix Your Period was that I wanted everyone to just start with the basics. Come back to chewing your food. None of us chew Mm -hmm. our food. We don't chew our food anymore. It's literally a meditative process. And yet this is not something that, or meditative practice, I should say, but it's not something that we do. And if you were to chew your food properly at every meal, you would notice that you have less bloating and less stomach pain and less digestive issues and possibly have better bowel movements. And so that's where I start with people. I actually really get back to basics because like I said, I feel like many of us have jumped from step zero to step five without really addressing that, you know, the foundational piece of the hormonal house. So like I said, chewing your food and arranging your plate in a way that means that you have, you know, half of it is carbohydrates in the form of veggies, meaning like the leafy greens and the, you know, the high nutrient foods like um, other vegetables, you know, the cruciferous vegetables um, and anything really that's not a potato, (laughs) because I know potatoes are considered vegetables. So yes, and then focusing on, you know, having another quarter of your plate is fat and then another quarter is protein. And we can all adjust that that template to suit us. But I find that if we can just do that and focus on eating food in a way that is, like I said, a bit of a meditative experience. So we're taking care of ourselves and we're not rushing around, standing up, you know, working, watching TV, doing 20 things while we try to eat as well, because that's inherently stressful for our bodies. So more than anything, what this is about is reducing the amount of physical and mental stress that our bodies have to deal with on a daily basis. And we have a lot of control over that for the most part. So yes, arranging your plate, chewing your food, and really working on balancing your blood sugar. And part of that is done through the arrangement of what's on your plate. And then of course, with that blood sugar, I I suggest people test their blood sugar using a glucometer. And they can do that in you know a certain fashion. I described it all in the book and in my programs over the years. But essentially, you want to see if the meal that you're eating is spiking your blood sugar. And if it is, that's inherently going to affect your hormones on you know in that downstream way, like I was describing. So starting there is potentially game changing for so many of us. Instead of you know taking twenty supplements, I love that. I love getting back to simple things, right? And Chewing your food is definitely something that I struggled with. I'm always like scarfing things down because I'm always on the go. And I've tried to make a conscious effort, you know, during COVID now that we are slowing down, which is like a gift that we've been given in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um, But to like actually just sit down, not have the TV on, have some music playing if needed, but just take the time to like just sit and have a meal and like talk and not rush through it. Yes. I love that so so much. Isn't it though? It's incredible. So I, I have a question for you because Mm -hmm. you said I'm always on the go. And so this Mm -hmm. is something that's continuing to come up because I have a group coaching program going on right now. And this is what we've been talking about, about how, how do you actually heal your hormones? And I think pretty much for all of us that there is a bit of an evolutionary mismatch happening right now. We are, our bodies were designed, female bodies in particular, were designed obviously uh, millions of years ago, and they were designed in a way to respond to a stressor. You know, cortisol rises, other stress hormones rise, you get over your stressor, and then they go back down and you go back to living a normal, relatively stress-free life until the next big stressor. But we live with stressor after stressor after stressor, and our bodies don't know the difference between running away from a predator and running on the treadmill or going running a marathon for fun. They don't, they don't totally know the difference. And this I think is another problem because we have packed our lives so full of stuff that we are now so so busy that many times I hear from women, well I don't have time to do all the things you're telling me to do. And I was like, "Well, why do you not have time? Like why is it that your life is so full of things, back-to-back things?" that you don't have time to take care of yourself because how are you going to be able to show up for your family and your friends and your children, your partner, when you are in a state of complete breakdown half the time? 
So that's, you know, that and it's not really, it's more of a rhetorical question, really not putting you on the spot at all. But I, I do think as women, we have to ask ourselves these hard questions because I'm seeing this now more and more and more that we are just slammed and there has to be some respite. There just has to be some way that we get a break from all the things that we've packed into our lives. A hundred percent. You know, I found so much, even with myself and my community and whatnot, that we just put everything else on the priority list, right? We're like yeah. constantly trying to meet the needs and the requests of everybody else. And like, you're, I mean, in my situation, I was supporting my family. So I had to work my night job to financially support them. I had a day job and then I had this in the podcast and, you know, just going, go, 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 go. Yeah. And the first thing that goes off that list is just taking care of yourself because you're putting everybody always before you. But I've tried to like now make a conscious effort because it always takes a wake up call or something to happen <laughs> for to, to have per perspective put back in your life. But just making that conscious effort to schedule in the things that I need to do for me. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Absolutely. Right? So put it in your calendar, set a reminder on your phone, like this is me time. This is what I need to do. These are the things that I need to put on my priority list before anything else, because if I don't take care of myself, I'm not going to be able to show up for my business, for my family, for my friends, for anything else that's on the go, because eventually I'm going to wear myself down. Absolutely. Amen to that. And I do agree that from a hormonal perspective as well, I mean, the hormone repair process is kind of no joke. I mean, when you get to that point where your HPA axis, which is your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and that's what basically runs your stress response. When that HPA axis is so dysregulated because of, again, that evolutionary mismatch I was just talking about, to get back on track is significantly harder. We, we, put, we put so much emphasis on things that don't really matter in our lives a lot of the time. We put meaning into them or we put meaning on them. And what we really need to put emphasis on is our wellness, because when you lose that, when you're sick, when you can't function, like I was 20 years ago, all I needed, all I cared about was getting better. That was it. That's all I could think about, because that's all we really have at the end of the day. And so for women, especially who have the tendency to martyr ourselves and to, and I do this too. So, you know, again, it's a lesson and a work in progress. We all are, but the martyring of ourselves and the putting everyone else first is doing no one any favors. And with hormones in particular, what's happening in our twenties and our thirties is 100% going to affect us in our forties and fifties. And the reason for that is because once your ovaries shut down, producing estrogen and producing progesterone every month, every cycle, your adrenals take over and they produce a little tiny bit of sex hormones to move you into or move you through menopause. And if your adrenals are shot for, from decades of not taking care of yourself, menopause is an absolute nightmare. And mm -hmm. so it's really something for us to think about too for the long term. I love that. I love that you said that. And I think it's so important for us to not wait for that moment <laughs> to change our lives because that setback, the healing journey is not an overnight journey. It takes a long time to get back on track sometimes, depending on how much damage you've made to your internal systems. And that is a setback that you probably don't want because you're wanting to do all these other things. So try to put that into your your mindset where like, okay, I need to do things for me. I need to take care of myself because I can't actually afford to lose all that time just focusing solely on a health healing journey. Exactly. Exactly. I know. It took me so many years. That's why I feel very passionate about this because it took a long time of, like I said before, feeling around in the dark, trying to figure this stuff out. And it, that's why I, I really just want women to know that this is, you know, they're important and they're worth it. And they're worth finding a doctor who will listen to them. They're worth, you know, pursuing avenues that they're told they shouldn't bother even pursue, be, even pursuing because, you know, all you need is a birth control pill or whatever it is. But I, you know, I, I fundamentally want women to know that their, their health is worth it, their lives are worth it, their bodies are, and they can get better. There is hope and there are answers. Mm -hmm. 
A hundred percent. I love that we touched on that. I do want to touch on entrepreneurial journeys um, later on in the interview in a little bit, um, but I want to jump back to periods. Um, now, this is something that I'm super awkward in mentioning, but when it comes to digestion, mm-hmm. how does it affect your period or how does it get affected by your period? Like constipation right before your period is no fun. <laughs> no, it's terrible. I know, right? It's funny. I was actually talking about this too. I was talking about it. I mentioned it in the book and I've talked about it extensively because it's one of these things talking about your digestion and poop is horrifying for women. Mm, We live in a funny society where girls, you know, they don't fart and they don't poop. So we can't talk about that stuff. And it's just like, it's crazy because when we don't talk about it, what happens? We formulate all kinds of ideas in our heads about what's normal and what's not. And then we live for years and years thinking that being chronically constipated and not going to the bathroom for five days in a row is totally fine. On the flip side, we also think that maybe if you have to run to the bathroom every time you eat, that's totally normal too. And it's interesting with your period because your cycle 100% affects your digestive system. And so with that said, uh, you know, the first thing that women often say to me is that they are, you know, they get their periods or right before their period, they get terrible diarrhea and they're, you know, stuck in the bathroom for, for a day or two sometimes because it's so bad. And so what I'll say is that when you are, when you think about your period, think of it as almost like an inflammatory event, because that's kind of what it is. So your progesterone drops significantly. So that's that hormone that's high in the second half of your cycle. So it drops down and that tells your uterine lining it's time to go. And there is a release of something called of, of chemicals called prostaglandins. And these prostaglandins stimulate your uterus, your, the muscles in your uterus to contract. And because of the proximity of your uterus to your bowels, your digestive tract, those prostaglandins travel. And the more inflamed we are, the more inflammatory prostaglandins we have roaming around our body. So that's another thing too. We have a lot of inflammation. We tend to have more period pain. We tend to have more digestive troubles around our periods as well. And we get migraines, things like that. So those prostaglandins can also trigger the muscles in your digestive tract and cause this, you know, these loose bowels, the diarrhea, things like that to happen. And then when we move out of that phase and into the follicular phase, estrogen has a bit of a different effect. It actually, well, sort of, it basically sort of supports your digestive function. It actually gets your bowels moving. And so women often have regular bowel movements during this time in the lead up to ovulation and things are, are mostly stable. And then at ovulation, oftentimes a lot of women say to me, they'll experience bloating, like really painful, gassy type bloating at ovulation. And that to me is often a sign that something's up with your gut. You might have an estrogen dominance type situation happening, inflammations going on. It's often accompanied with ovulatory pain. So where you're, you know, that, that follicle where it's, the egg where it's leaving the follicle, like you feel not just a twinge, but you actually feel cramping and pain. And again, like I said, I always feel like this comes back to healing the gut and and some kind of inflammation happening. And once that's addressed, usually those symptoms go away or they're not disruptive. And then coming back into that luteal phase leading up to your period again, progesterone has a bit of an opposite effect of estrogen. So progesterone actually is like a muscle relaxant. So it calms the muscles down. And so it slows down the muscle move, the movements or the smooth, smooth muscle movements in your digestive tract. And as a result, you become constipated. So oftentimes we, we see a lot of constipation in that second half of your cycle. But like I said, these symptoms really shouldn't disrupt your life. Like this, it can definitely happen and it's no big deal if you notice constipation one or two times in your luteal phase, but, or, you know, you might notice that your bowel movements are a little quicker during your period, but it shouldn't be a situation where it completely disrupts your life. To me, like I said before, that indicates that something's up, like you're somewhere along your digestive tract, things are not working and there needs to be some healing there. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Definitely makes sense. 
Um, I have a random question in regards to tampons, diva cups, pads, like all that. What your thoughts on? Like, I feel, I don't know why, but I have some kind of reservation inside that feels weird putting something plastic inside me, like silicone or whatever. Ah, uh, okay. With like a cup? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, the cups are, are actual silicone. They're not plastic. So there's, yeah. And that's, it's pretty much an inert substance. So it's, my understanding is that it's, they're generally safe. I mean, if there was an allergy of some kind, which are tend to be very rare, then that would be a problem. But for the most part, silicone is, is safe. And I, uh, but you know, a lot of women feel that way too. They're not super sold on a cup, whereas others are diehard fans. So I feel as though with menstrual cups, it's either one thing or the other. <laughs> I don't personally use them. I use period underwear. So for me, that's, that's my jam. And I really like those, but yeah, like for some people, cups are really convenient. They work long hours, things like that. So they hold more volume than a tampon or a pad or period underwear might do. So yes, cups are, are amazing for that. And if you're interested in it, then I feel like people should definitely try them and see. There's a bit of a learning curve, I think, for cups. But ultimately, I find that user satisfaction for them is really high. And then with pads and tampons and period underwear, my biggest goal for women is to avoid products that are potentially toxic or contain ingredients that are questionable. And for the most part, regular pads and tampons, you know, all the big brands you'd find in a drugstore are made out of very questionable ingredients. And there's, you know, you really have to get organic cotton pads and tampons if you're going to use those because our vaginal tissue, first of all, it's very vascularized, meaning there's a lot of blood flow there. There are, the tissue is very thin, highly absorbent. So if you are using a traditionally manufactured tampon, for instance, first of all, the materials used to create those tampons are all synthetic. So you guys might, you, anyone listening might know this, you might notice when you take a tampon out, it kind of hurts like you're, you know, you're leaving fibers behind when you pull it out because they're so absorbent that they absorb not only all of the blood and the menstrual fluid, but they also absorb all of the vaginal fluids as well in your vaginal canal. So it's not fun to use those for years and years on end. And the other thing is, is that these products are bleached and the residue left over or the ingredient left over is something known as dioxin. And the World Health Organization has definitely unequivocally said that this is a harmful toxin. And yet we're putting that into our vaginas almost every month for many years on end. And so oftentimes women say to me when they switch to, you know, reusable cotton pads or a menstrual cup or period underwear or something like that from the traditionally made tampons and pads, they find that their periods are lighter, that they have less period pain, that they have less vaginal infections um, and vaginal odor and things like that. And so it makes a lot of sense that when you take away those products that are offending that we we have better, we have an improvement in our symptoms. Oh my God. Right? <laughs> I know. You just completely blew my mind. I had no idea. I, I nobody do does. research. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah. I wrote about it in the book too, because I felt that it was really something that we should talk about. The whole, I mean, when you think about the quote unquote vaginal care industry, <laughs> Summer's Eve and all of those people, they, they, if you look at the ingredients on those products, it's shocking. I mean, you're putting oh that God. into your vaginal canal. And a lot of women use this these products on a daily basis. They use the wipes and the creams and the powders and all of this stuff that is absolutely messing with their vaginal microbiome because we have a whole microbiome in our vaginal canal and just like the microbiome in your gut. And the that's why I say, I keep saying, you know, you've got to heal your gut. You've got to work on your gut health because your gut definitely impacts your vaginal microbiome too, because of our close proximity. And as a result, we, uh, you know, we, we totally disturb that bacteria and then we run into major problems that become chronic. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to get to that part of the book. I haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> All good. Um, That makes me want to, I mean, I'm on my period now and I'm like, crap, Like, I need cotton tampons or I need to try one of those cups. Like, Totally. 
or, you know, period underwear or, you know, you re- reusable pads. I mean, we're doing all kinds of great things now. I think it's amazing because we're definitely at a time in our lives where innovation is, feels like it's at a peak and there are so many cups available for all different sizes. Uh, you know, our cervixes could be low or could be high. Vaginal canals could be short or long. So there's lots of different cup options. There are tons of different period panty products now on the market. There's lots of reusable pads. There are many different cotton pads and tampons that are available. So we have a wide array of options, which is amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Now, I do want to talk about one thing that um, I'm hoping you have some suggestions on. So when it comes to your period and all these cycles that you're going through and your hormones and all that stuff, and you know, there's certain periods that you're like really high energy and things like that. How, as an entrepreneur, how can you use your cycle to be at your best for your business? So oh, like, this is, so you know, this is, you know, a period or a phase that maybe you should be making decisions and you should be super creative and like kind of spending time in that zone. And then in this phase, you should stay away from this. And Totally. Yes. I really love that you asked this question because it really is part of our ability to kind of harness our innate superpowers, I suppose you could say, because we have these cycles and they are mostly a monthly cycle. I consider a regular or normal menstrual cycle to be anywhere from 25 to 35 days. So we're looking mostly at a month for the majority of us. And what is so amazing is that we change almost on a weekly basis. In fact, we're kind of like a different person almost every week of our cycle, which is incredible. And it can be a really good thing. I think we we certainly need to flip the script on hormones and the reputation that hormones have, generally speaking. But yes, like when you think about your menstrual cycle and how to align it with your life and your business, there's so much that can be done. So when you're thinking about your period and that first week or so of your cycle, usually this is a time where your body is like, listen, lady, I am really trying to just chill out here. (laughs) So we, I feel like women should really, we should harness that because we don't get a lot of opportunity to rest and our bodies are literally asking us to rest. I mean, we are actually bleeding without dying. And I feel like we should try and honor that. (laughs) Just take a moment, take a breath if we can. And, you know, I know that that is not at all optional for a lot of people. And so even if you can build in five minutes here, 10 minutes there of just closing your eyes, doing a meditation, deep breathing, whatever it is that brings you down, takes your nervous system offline is what you need to do for yourself. And so this is a time where you really have to take it down a notch. And I always recommend not taking interviews during this time, not doing public speaking, not doing anything forward facing, outwardly facing that is going to require you to be using your cognitive function at, you know, at its peak. So that's really what I I ask women to do during this time. Like think about how you can just take it down a notch and, and really take care of yourself as best you possibly can. And then focus on the internal during this time. It's really great to plan out your month. Think about what it is you want the month to look like. How can you visualize you know, what the coming weeks will look like and what it is that you are envisioning for your business during this time. And then from there, so you're planting seeds there. And then from there, you're moving now into the non-bleeding portion of the follicular phase. You're approaching ovulation. Estrogen and testosterone are rising. They both make you, first of all, estrogen, like I said, it makes your skin look great. You have better hair days. Your testosterone is responsible for your confidence and your brain function, both estrogen and progesterone and and testosterone actually. And so at that point, you're now primed for being out in the world, public speaking, doing interviews, speaking up in meetings, taking charge of projects, and really putting yourself out there. Product launches or program launches, if you run an, an online business, for instance, and you know, and really generally brainstorming and using those heightened cognitive skills is going to be something that really serves you during this time. And then from there, we're now starting to like, we're coming off the high of ovulation. Ovulation is sort of the peak of that. So it really is that time to just be out there like networking, 
um, especially if you're going to networking events by yourself. Like this is the time where you would be the most confident to speak, you know, to speak to people that you don't know, things like that. And then after you come off of ovulation and things are starting to wind down, I say to women, you know, think about how you feel, check in with yourself. Do you feel like you want to be doing those things? Because a lot of the time, like that week after ovulation, we're all still great. We're kind of riding off the high of ovulation and, and we continue to do a lot of the things we were doing in those previous weeks. And then what will happen is there's, there tends to be a shift. For some of us, it's quite dramatic. And for others, it's subtle. It kind of reminds me of the shift from summer to fall. And you know, you just notice like the air changes and it becomes a little more crisp. And you definitely notice with your body too, like, hmm, I feel like I don't want to do the thing I was just doing a week ago. And so I say to women, think about how you can focus on internal practices in your business. What's going on internally? Do you need to handle your bookkeeping or your accounting? Or is there you know, a launch or a program or something like that that you want to outline? Whatever it is that needs your attention internally that will help you, uh, you know, build internally and then you know you can you can reap the rewards of that in the next phase of your cycle when things are picking up again and you're out there in the world but yeah focusing on what's happening on you know on a lower level in your business versus like that higher level stuff would be that would be the time to do that wow that's such great advice i love it thank you so much for sharing that um, now, before we end this interview, I would love to hear about what you have available to help women with your periods. Oh, yes, so much. Um, you know, I've been blogging now for almost 10 years. So my blog has a ton of information. If anybody wanted to dig a little bit deeper, it's NicoleJardim.com. And of course, I have this book out in the world. It's called Fix Your Period. It is literally the culmination of everything <laughs> that I've been doing yeah. for this long. And there are nearly like 500 research studies in there as well. I, I've really felt strongly about showing women that this actually does exist and there is research to back it up. And I walk you through menstruation education, basically, in the first three chapters. And then I walk everyone through a six-week protocol so that women can finally take back control of their cycles if they want to do that. I mean, it's like I said before, it takes work, but at the end of the day, this is your body and you deserve health and wellness. And so I'm walking you through all that in the book. It's a great resource. You can come back to it over and over again. I also have a fix your period program and that is kind of like the book, but brought to life. <laughs> and so I, you know, I walk everyone through uh, what I talk about in the book and then some, of course, because obviously things are a little bit different in programs and in books. So those are those are my main resources for women. I'm also on Instagram and I share information almost daily about periods and hormones and women's health in general. Amazing. So is Instagram the best place to connect with you? Um, I would say, yeah, it is. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nicole, for taking the time to break down our periods and to give us such great insight on how we can better understand what's going on inside our bodies. I know I've learned a ton so far already, and I can't wait to finish your book. And I definitely recommend everybody to go out there and get it because there's just so much going on that you just don't know about in your bodies. And it's just so incredible what we can do with, you know, what's going on internally. Thank you so much, Jessica. It was really great to be on and chat with you. I'm Jessica, and thanks for tuning in today to Love Unplugged, the podcast. If there are any questions or topics you'd love answered on the show, head on over to www.projectloveco.com and share your request with me. If you haven't yet, go to iTunes and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast and share it with a loved one. Your feedback means the world to me, and the community we've created is what fuels our discussions here. After all, this is all for you. Join me next time for another Unplugged Conversation.